We are continuing in Matthew chapter 25 uh, from verse 14, which says, For the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you deliver to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you deliver to me two talents here. I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. We ask the Lord to bless his word to us tonight. You may know that we had been going through Matthew chapter 24 and chapter 25 since I think October uh, when I was speaking looking at the events that the Lord Jesus was talking about about the last days and uh, the things concerning that and the surprising thing is that as Jesus was talking about the things of the end and he spends a bit of time talking about that he then goes into these three parables that have to do with warnings, one after the other, and then the fourth, which is not a parable, just an account of the last judgment, in which again he gives the warnings uh, and blessings, and says this is how the faithful servants, this is what will happen to them, and this is what will happen to those who are taken by surprise uh, by his coming. So you have the three Three of these uh, parables, one after the other. It starts with uh, ministry with the servant who has been put over others to give them their food in their proper time. And then it goes on to the parable of the virgins, uh, speaking about the oil, those who, who neglected to keep oil in their lamps. And then here, uh, the parable of the talents. And... Uh, this is another parable uh, of the kingdom, uh, what the kingdom will be like then. And as I was thinking about these things for this uh, third parable, it just dawned on me that how, how fascinated people are, and there I say I could be, with the uh, end times, you know, o over the course of my life, you know, um, are you pre-trib or post-trib or amillennial or pre-millennial? Where do you believe about the rapture? Will there be one or will there not be a when? Will it be? And, and uh, all that stuff. 
And uh, Jesus does touch and answer uh, some of those questions uh, or speaks about those issues. But then the, the thing he's focusing on uh, is not those things at all. You know, we think if I watch another 20-hour uh, series on the end times by some famous person, then maybe I will discern better when Jesus will come or uh, if we are in the last times now or is Jesus coming. And yet, uh, from all of those people, I realize you don't hear the second part, and I believe the more pertinent part of what Jesus is saying in that, in that whole uh, passage, because this is the last things that he's saying, and then he's heading to the cross. Uh, these these, these uh, warnings that say, be ready and watch. Watch and be ready. And then giving examples of all the people who should have been ready for his coming, but are not. And what happens to them. Uh, so, let's look at this uh, parable of the talents. And uh, we find the master who represents, uh, clearly represents God, who, because it's a, a parable of the kingdom, this is about the business of the kingdom, who entrusts his property to servants, to a number of his servants. And he gives them a command to put it to work, put, put, to put the talents to work. Now, a talent in the Old Testament was about 34 kilograms. So uh, we assume 34 kilograms of gold. In the New Testament, it represents about 6,000 drachmas, uh, or about 20 year wages for a daily laborer who was paid one denarius per day. So it's quite, quite a lot of money, 34 kilograms of gold per talent. And the command is implied. If you, if you look in uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, you'll find that there is uh, the parable of the miners. And there's 10 servants, there's 10 miners, and each get given an, uh, one miner each. And, but then they each come back, with, one with 10 more, one with five more, and so on. In this parable, the way it's told by Matthew, uh, they get five, and then uh, three, and then two. And they are commanded to conduct kingdom business, uh, until the servant returns. The expectation is that from the master that his servants would be busy and that the kingdom would prosper under their service at an individual level. As in the other parables, the stories of the, the ones who did well are very short. The first one got five talents. He goes out, he brings five more, and his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little, I will set you over much, and enter into the joy of your master. The second one is told the same. Curiously, he gets a below medium amount. Three would have been in the middle, but he gets two, which is one more than one. So he was near to the one who didn't do so well. He gets two, and he makes two more. Uh, they lived in the service of the master, and the text says that immediately they went out and put it to work. And we are told that a long time had passed, so when the master is about to come back, they made double. And then there was the one, the one who received one talent, and on the surface it, it seemed to me uh, that it was the behavior of a jealous person, that maybe he was offended, that he was given least and he was trusted. You know, his ability was not valued and was given only one talent and, and uh, all that. So he goes and buries it and he doesn't do uh, anything with it. But when we read Luke chapter 19, we find that where they are given equal amounts, we find out, find out that he comes back with the same excuse that uh, he makes uh, to the master. Uh, the assessment of the master is that the behavior of the person is wicked and lazy. Uh, that's what uh, he is called. Uh, he, he hears the command, he sees how the other servants interpret it, but he decides that he needs to, what he needs to do is instead go and bury 
his talent, uh, supposedly in the interest of self-preservation. Uh, so for a long time he lives as though he has no master, uh, he spends his time doing whatever he wants, living life for himself, and letting the master concern himself, himself about his own things. And the master suffers loss uh, to his property. Uh, because you, in those days you bought a servant, or the servant sold himself to you for his labor. And there is a loss of income with this man who chooses to do nothing and mind his own business instead of his master's. Uh, the others achieve a doubling of the property of the master uh, during this time. And he is, we find that he is not only unprofitable, but he is insulting. So when the master comes and uh, tries to take him to account over what he did, his excuse is an insult to the master. Uh, his excuse is based on a negative statement about the master's character. He says in verse 24, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. He says, I knew that you are powerful, and I knew that you are a harsh man. Uh, I knew you have so much power, and you are unjust that you can get any amount of money you want from wherever you want. You don't need to have the normal course of things to take place. You don't need to sow because you can just go and take it. So you can have what is not legitimately yours. So I was afraid. I was afraid of you based on my insight into your true character. I chose to disobey the command and I went for self-preservation instead. This is what he's saying. So I kept what you gave me, and here it is. And uh, this just struck a chord with me as I, I heard his excuse, because it's such a, an unexpected excuse. Uh, I don't believe, as you will see later, that this is this parable is uh, necessarily about mission, uh, or about mission in particular. Uh, but uh, I remembered something that uh, I read when I read the life of William Carey uh, at one point, And the Lord was stirring him up to go to India and to do all that. And he was talking to ministers. And apparently he was, while he was making an impassioned plea about the need to evangelize the the heathen, go to the end of the world, and so on. Uh, one of them interrupted him and said, Young man, sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he'll do it without consulting you or me. Uh, and every time I hear this parable, it kind of echoes that, that you know, God, God is powerful. God can do whatever he wants. So, if you want someone saved, God will save them. There's nothing you and I can do for or against it. Uh, if you do something or if you don't, it makes no difference. Um, and certainly God is powerful and certainly God is able to do all that. Uh, but I found there's only one problem is that it's not what the Bible portrays God to be like. And it's not what the Bible shows God to, uh, as what he commanded us to do and how to do it. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that us doing something or not doing something has a direct bearing on a person's salvation. We are told that those are two great questions for us to ask. God didn't ask us to, to concern ourselves uh, with these things and figure them out. Uh, what we do know is that we have to be obedient. And the key word in, in all of this is obedience. God tells us to do something, we have to do it. And this is what the servants in this parable did. Uh, and all the words that Jesus says, and all the warnings that Jesus gives, I believe they're not idle words. I believe they very much uh, mean what they say. 
uh, and he gave them, he didn't give them for no reason, he gave them because they would be crucial for his, for his disciples to, to know and be aware and truly listen to what he said that watch out and uh, be ready because I am coming at a time that you do not know. So the master says, really, that is what your opinion of me is. Uh, you should have given, at least given the money to bankers so I can get some profit. Uh, giving what, they, what he had to others was like the least form of service because he was called to service himself as a servant. I thought that very interesting. Uh, and yet he was unconcerned uh, with the master's gain. And then for his blasphemy and wickedness, he is thrown outside uh, into the outer darkness, uh, which we have seen up to this point uh, to mean hell. And uh, I've heard people talk about it before, saying that this is the outer darkness of regrets or or bad feelings or something like that, but even looking through what others had to say, had to comment on this passage, everyone agrees that the outer darkness where there's uh, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth represents hell. So what are the talents about? What property did God give us uh, that we have to administer uh, on his behalf that we are set to work with? And uh, it has to do partly with money, partly with talent or abilities. And generally, this is what I grew up hearing. Uh, but I believe it has to do with much more than this. Uh, it very much to do with the kingdom and our role in the kingdom. And in fact, it has to do uh, with the whole of who we are in Christ Jesus. Uh, in the teaching of Jesus, in the, I remember the Great Commission, uh, go there in Matthew 28, 19, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And what struck me about that is, he didn't say, go and give them the list of commands of what they have to obey as disciples of Jesus. He tells them, what I have commanded you. You are the deposit of God's commands. So that's part of that talent of gold that God gave us, that we are in charge of. And we are people who come to Christ come to among a people where, who have the commands of God, and he says, teach them how th these disciples have to be taught how to observe. So, so they, we, we, we show them how, by example, by us doing them ourselves. So that's part of the talent. But I believe there's more than that. And, and uh, I came to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, 19 to 20, which says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We have the Holy Spirit, and then our body and our spirit themselves are God's. So we were, given, we were gifted in Christ, our body and our spirit which are regenerated, and we were gifted the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit himself. So we are full with the talents uh, that God gave us. Our whole life is precious gold, and we have been purchased with the precious blood of Christ. And our life of faith, in our life of faith, the Bible teaches that we have to be profitable in God's kingdom. Contrary to what sometimes evangelicals tend to think, de facto beliefs, not theoretical beliefs, they'll give you a good answer, but we are not here just to warm seats 
and wait to go to heaven while we pay one person to, to do all the work. He says that we each have a, a, a place and a role to play in the kingdom of God. And I think it's about my commitment to the command that my life must count in the kingdom of God. What gain did God receive from me in his kingdom and among his people this last year? This people whom the Holy Spirit is busy building up into a temple for the living God and he gifts us to be an encouragement to one another. What did God gain from me in his kingdom in this past year? He gives us different gifts to each one for the benefit of others and we serve according to our faith. And I just want to read uh, Romans 12, uh, a short passage that, that states this very clearly. Where Paul says, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. So presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice is a spiritual service. Don't, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace that was given me to every man who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think reasonably, as God has apportioned to each person a measure of faith. For even as we have many members in one body, for, and all the members don't have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts differing according to the grace that was given us, if prophecy, let's prophesy according to the portion of our faith, or service, let's give ourselves to service, or he who teaches to his teaching, or he who exhorts to his exhorting, or he who gives, let him do it with generosity, he who rules with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This is what administering the talent is, is all about. It's not just donating a bit more time and donating a bit more money. It's how we put ourselves in the service of, of the kingdom, in the place that the Holy Spirit wants us to be, and to serve in, in, in the measure of our faith and to the extent that he wants us to serve and to grow in that. I think uh, pride is the fly in the ointment of, of Christian service. There's a very fine line between serving in how the Holy Spirit leads you or where the Holy Spirit wants you and crossing the line and over-serving and becoming a hindrance rather than a help because you go over uh, the measure of faith uh, that you have. So. Are we allowing ourselves to be used? Are we willing to engage, to be used by the Holy Spirit? Because without a shadow of doubt, the Holy Spirit wants to use us. The body of Christ is not the same uh, without the, the least of the people in it. Uh, we need each other, and I, I thought it's, it's amazing as we read in the Bible, those who have tongues and those who have interpretation, for example, one depending on another, and all of them doing it for others. God didn't allow one, the one person to be all in all the one-man band show, but all of us depending on one another in uh, ways as the Holy Spirit is working and raising us uh, in his kingdom. So am I living up to who God wants me to be, and am I bringing profit and increase to his work and to his body? Uh, I will just, 
uh, conclude with uh, what Peter says. I like to go through the scriptures because it's good to see confirmation uh, from the scriptures who encourages us to watch how we pass the time in his kingdom. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17 says, If you call on him as father, who without respect of persons judges according to each man's work, pass the time of your living as foreigners here in reverent fear knowing that you were redeemed not with corruptible things, with silver or gold, from the useless way of life handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb without blemish or spot, the blood of Christ. And his punchline is so that we can love each other fervently. So I, I thought that was really summarizing what the parable of the talents is talking about and I pray that God makes us willing servants who work for the profit uh, of our master in his kingdom. Amen.